Next on Lakeshore Focus, we have the one, the only, our man in Washington, Congressman Peter Visklowski. Let's hear what he has to say. Stay with us. Welcome again to Lakeshore Focus, a weekly show highlighting the key issues, important events, and interesting people in our region. I'm Keith Kirkpatrick. There is one face and one name known above all others in our region of Northwest Indiana, and that name and that face, including the rest of him, mind, body, and voice, are here with us in the studio. United States Congressman Peter Visklowski, representing Indiana's first congressional district. You've been at this quite a while now, right? Keith, I have, and it's great to be on your program, finally. It's been a while. It, it has been, but you've been in Congress now 36 years? Uh, 33, 33 years. 33 years. Yes, sir. Okay, i got to do a better math of this. So at what point, Pete, do you get to be called venerable? Is it enough gray hair or then years you've been or your age? Keith, I'm a public servant. I just try to keep my head down and work hard every day. So have you been called that though? Just I have like, never, been, never called been called that. Called I horrible. have been called a lot of names though. <laughs> well, I could I could use that one, but maybe you're not quite old enough for that one. Maybe you got to be a little little older than this to get the venerable title. Right. But I'm glad to really have you on the show. Thank you very show. much. So we live in interesting times. We do. And, and you're in Washington in interesting times. So I think one of the greatest criticism people have is what's wrong with Congress that you people can't figure out how to work together? What's your take on this? Keith, there's really two answers. Uh, one is we do have problems as far as the functioning of the day-to-day -day running of the United States government. Uh, our year started on October 1st. We will not, under the best of circumstances, complete the funding decisions to run the government until December 8th. During the past fiscal year, we did not resolve our differences until the middle of May. Uh, we don't have enough time on your program to go through all of the reasons as to why this happens. But I would say uh, there's a number of political parties in the Congress, and there is a group of individuals who, just as my colleague Charlie Dent, a Republican from Pennsylvania, said, couldn't bring themselves to say yes to the sun coming up tomorrow. And well, as you what, can imagine, what is, what is wrong with? I mean, I, I got to say, Keith, I don't know what the motivation is, and unfortunately, uh, in any process, uh, legislative work, if you want to do nothing as you hit a deadline, your leverage increases. Uh, my great frustration, on behalf of the people I represent, is the vast majority of the members of the House and Senate are decent human beings. They are intelligent human beings. They do work hard. They want to lead the world a little bit better. But the extremes have really hijacked the process. So how do those people get elected, those extremes? Are they really from a district that has that many extreme people who are voting for them? Uh, some of it is redistricting, uh, has come very, very precise. Uh, some of it, I would point out, uh, when I first ran for Congress, understanding that was some years ago, in a 15-month campaign, I raised $80,000, and I beat an incumbent member of Congress. Today, money has washed the system uh, with these super PACs that are accountable to no one. Uh, I think also the fact that there is no real solid news in the video media nationally anymore. You turn on a cable news network program and there's four people with one shred of information with four opinions and where is the news about what's happening in Indonesia today or the flood in Japan? On national public radio and TV. That That's is, where it's at. That and PB, uh, BBC. Mm -hmm. BBS uh, those and BBC. Are, if you want news, those are the two outlets to go to. Uh, I would suggest to you the majority of Americans are not accessing that news. So the lack of facts make this debate very difficult. I can't tell you how many times people have come up to me and say, I've seen this on the internet. I said, well, here are the facts. They said, you're lying to me. I said, if I was going to lie to you, I would make you happy. <laughs> you're still unhappy. 
these are the facts. Well, I saw it on the internet, or I saw it on this program, or I heard it on this radio program. Also, the impulse of many public officials to have an opinion like that because something happened three minutes ago uh, because of social media. So there's many contributing factors. There is no excuse. And I would say, structurally, uh, the big problem we face right now is an act called the Budget Control Act. Uh, that was passed after the 2010 election uh, that still is going to be in place, absence its repeal for another four years, that again has structured the fiscal debate in a very uh, bizarre, artificial, unproductive Yeah, this has been going on, this whole for, budget thing, uh, for years decade. now. a whole decade, and I would tell you, again, I have great responsibilities for funding the Department of Defense. Secretary of Defense, who is a very solid human being, very competent human being. I have great respect for Secretary Mattis. Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff, they're beside themselves. And I've told some of my colleagues who, because they want to cut spending, you have now wasted more money with continuing resolutions, with sequestration across the board cuts, with shutting down the government, with the uncertainty. You've wasted more time of people's lives planning three different budget scenarios let us at least run the day-to-day -day operation of the government. But that opinion must not be the predominant opinion of trying, trying to do this, because it, it doesn't happen, right? Keith, I believe it is the majority opinion in the Congress, but the way the majority party has structured the debate on the floor, referencing back to two speakers ago, there is an internal custom that unless a majority of the majority party agrees to a bill, it will not hit the floor. So we got a lot of rules that don't seem to make a whole lot of sense anymore. Well, let me ask you this. If, if this is like fighting a losing war, right? And the way you maybe can win, you say, if there's one thing we can do, we're just gonna throw everything at one thing and hopefully it'll break it loose or maybe start the change. If there was one thing that you could do, or we could do, what would that strategic thing be, or that risky thing? No, uh, it's not really a risky thing, it's just day-to-day -day operation of the government, and we have done it twice temporarily, and that is to essentially modify and set aside the Budget Control Act, uh, but we have done it temporarily twice. We may have an opportunity again to do it this fall. If so, I would hope we do away with the Budget Control Act, not because I do not want to balance the budget. We have done that within recent memory. But to remove these artificial constraints on what do we need today? We need to invest in this country. We need to bring equity and simplicity to the tax code. We are a nation at war. We have an aging population and have to preserve entitlement programs for the next generation. And these artificial rules are just destroying the ability to address those issues. There are people talking about trying to come to some agreement where, for example, there's something in it you don't like and I don't like. And there's something in it you like and I like. That is doing a deal. That is an agreement. That is compromise. But you know what's that has been absent. You know what's interesting as you talk about this, because everybody talks how far we are apart in this country on polar opposites of things. But I think one thing is, I think most of us agree what the big issues are in this country. Yes. You just rattled them off. And I think all sides would say, yep, yeah, those are the big things. Fix the taxes, what are we doing with the elderly? We got issues, you know, just, you kind of went through the whole litany of them. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Is that a starting point? It's a starting point and we have to convince uh, public officials in Washington that the country, the people of this country, I believe, are ahead of them. When I've talked about I these like issues, that. including entitlement programs, Social Security, uh, Medicare, that are earned benefits people have paid taxes on, at town forums, and I've said this very thing, and that we need to make changes to preserve it for the next generation. Nobody has strung me up. Now we can debate exactly what the best way to do it. What has happened, uh, particularly with the entitlement programs, and I remind people, is two thirds of every dollar we spend, Social Security, Medicare, some Medicaid, a couple of farm programs, interest on the debt. And we've been fighting over everything else. Now, that's, that's the rub, is when George Bush said, we're gonna privatize Social Security, it was like, that's the third rail. So I would tell you very frankly, 
My party has loved beating up Republicans because you're going to do away with these programs. Republicans, who are tired of getting beat up, they don't want to talk about it at all. The president has said, we're not going there. So let's just leave two thirds of the equation and we'll do nothing. And people have to remember over half of the rest of government spending is for our national defense. That's not going to go away. We have to do something. And the American people are ahead in what I've suggested to party leaders, just be quiet. Let us have a rational conversation. Let us all hold hands and let us come to an agreement. We did that as a nation in the 1990s and we balanced the budget. So we you're have saying we done that in social security changes before to make sure we have preserved it. We have done it before. This is not an impossible task. So you think there's a possibility of singing hands? Probably can't get them to sing Kumbaya, but probably could get them the to hold hands. The singing would be off note if I participated <laughs> in that, but I've had these conversations and many of my colleagues on both sides just, I'm convinced the majority is there if we could get rid of some of these artificial constraints. The sooner we do it, and this fall is the time to act, because whether people like it or not, you will begin to have the pressure of the electoral process uh, come 2018. Let me ask you something more on a personal side of this, because I've seen you talk to people in town groups, and you really present so well. 32 years ago, was it this easy, or did you screw up a lot? Oh, I have made a lot of mistakes in my life. Uh, I told people the day I announced uh, the concept of the Marquette plan to recapture up to 75% of the lakeshore, which I still adhere to. We're making progress, Huge. the quality of place. I stand by it. You could have heard a pin drop in that room of public officials in the Rayburn Building in Washington, D.C. And before I finished my speech, I thought to myself, I made a big mistake. What was the mistake? You think? I made a whole series of mistakes. One, I did not sit down with each mayor of each of the communities involved to explain what I thought we should be thinking about. And again, this is voluntary. It's long term. It's as parcels come open. You dropped the bomb. I just told them what we're going to do. So they were not appreciative. I don't own any property on Lake Michigan in 1985 in June. I don't have USX, Arcelor, other mills that were there. Nobody called us. I would just say there's two parts of a long list of, boy, I didn't think that out. So you've learned since then to I think these things through a little bit every better. day, and let's make sure we communicate. And I think after 30 years of trying with the South Shore, and a lot of this has is, is been needlessly delayed uh, by just really unfounded arguments against it. Uh, I've admired is, how you... Is that uh, this last go-around, the last three, four years, has been absolutely public, transparent, uh, not just myself, others, yourself, every made presentations, public meetings, input, people happy, sad, come up with good ideas as to, well, maybe this is a little better way to approach it. Learn from mistakes over that period of time. So I'd like to sit here and blame somebody. That never gets you any place. I can look back and say, yeah, there's a couple of approaches I took over these 30 years that probably were counterproductive myself. Well, I've admired the way you've handled this, the South Shore expansion and so forth, because you've showed a lot of patience uh, a lot of accepting of difference of opinion, um, and it seems like it's paid off. It's, it's been slower probably than you'd hoped, but we seem to be getting there. Um, why can't other people see that this approach works, or why can't they have this kind of patience? Uh, I can't answer all of those questions, except I would say for the future of Northwest Indiana. A couple of things have also changed along the way. It's not just the argument or a light finally going off. I think that's part of it, just a repetition and openness. Part of it is the people involved. Uh, you look at the people who are managing and uh, running the South Shore. Uh, you look at Bill Hanna and others, the board who are on the RDA. If the RDA did not exist, if it was not created, by Ms. Daniels and our legislative delegation that unanimously supported it in 2005. We wouldn't be having this conversation today. So a lot of it too is now there's people they know 
where the future lies. They know what the right thing to do is. They've worked hard. They've been abused, and they've stayed the course. They understand that the caravan passes, the jackals bark. I would, I would agree. We've got some pretty good leaders in place Great right leaders. now. And so now's a good time to move. Is there something else you feel like we should be moving on in this region that maybe we're not m making as much progress as we should? What would be that next thing? I mean, we kind of got the rail thing going. We got a number of good things going. And the market plan is very far advanced, still a ways to go. Is there something else, or what's that next big project? I know we haven't got these other two done, but. Yeah, uh, I, I would say a couple of things. One, to encourage more rapid progress, that we're just not ever going to be satisfied again, waiting for the steel jobs to come back. I don't ride the train. This is the way we've always done it. No, we are going to make an investment. We are going to make a change. We Secondly, do move slowly. find that issue area that you do have an affinity for, you do have an expert, and get involved. We're not done with the train. And I tell people somewhat facetiously, when we lay the first tie for the expansion, I can't wait for that person to come up and say, well, why didn't you take that to Velpo? Why didn't you take it to Lowell? Let's go do that. And on the Lakeshore, we've made some progress, but not nearly enough. Where's the pressure? Let's get going to open it up like they have in Chicago for that quality of place so those young people that have left stop doing that and they come home. We have wetlands. I'm old enough to call them swamps in the old days. We have bike trails. Now let us connect the Calumet wetland preserve for that quality of place. Uh, in the past month, I've had conversations with people at Ivy Tech. I would tell you again, it's the people, it's the systems that are in place, vastly different than a generation ago. You lost your job at USX in 1985. Here's how to write a resume. Good luck getting a job. Now, as you come in, if you need some remedial help, we won't charge you for that. We will help you with that. What's your skill? Where do you want to go? Employers like NIPSCO, Porter Memorial, NITCO, we'll give you the equipment we need people trained on. We'll give you that curriculum. Then you can build an associate degree off of that. They're working on it because we can do the South Shore perfectly. How do we, we can get draw those jobs, but then we need people with the talent to get those jobs. How do we get people to move a little faster on some of these issues? I agree with you on, and you've, again, laid out a great agenda for what we need to do. But how do we get people to move a little faster? Because that is one of our downfalls or barriers. I, I think a, a couple of things, Keith. One, if you don't like what we're doing, and a lot of people don't. I mean, it's just my dad told me that they got sworn in. He said, you're never going to be universally loved again. And he was right, because you got to make a decision. If you don't like what we're doing, and you got a better idea, what is it? Just don't, don't, don't just say criticize. no. What is your better idea? If you got one, listen, there are people, myself included, we are happy to get going down that road. Secondly, I do think the psychology has changed. And some of this is, yeah, they were waiting for the steel jobs to come back. This is the way it always was. That generation, by and large, has moved, or they're gone, or they're retired. And so I think as younger people are here, we aren't going to take this anymore. We are going to want more change. I think as you see people recognize the value of Northwest Indiana, absent bad weather in the winter, we have every advantage on the planet Earth. That's why we're all here. That's why Rockefeller and Morgan invested money here. And people are appreciating it now. And, and, and they're appreciating it. They're appreciating it now. Is young people are going to say, you know, we're starting to get these jobs, and they're manufacturing jobs. We're making things. It's not steel. It's other stuff. It could be pharmaceuticals. It could be technology. Hey, we want it different. We're going to we're going to be more active. So I think we're we are past the trough. And and I dated to 2015, when our state legislators and God bless them coming together to work with uh, Governor Pence. Uh, to finally say the state recognizes we are going to be the engine for the state. We are a Great Lake state. We're going to invest in you. Mayor Freeman Wilson finished the runway at the airport after all these years. We're coming out of that. And I think it feeds on itself, and it's a bad analogy. I don't want to be the last one on the train. <laughs> so I think it's going to change. But people ought to say, if, if you have a better idea, let us know. If not, get on board. Do, do something. The National Guard 
uh, with the encouragement of Senator Young, cooperation and leadership of Mayor Freeman Wilson, uh, within the last uh, month, 45 days, tore down 13 homes abandoned in the city of Gary. What's 13 homes? I got six out. There's 13 we don't have to tear down anymore. Somebody made a decision. Somebody invested money. Somebody improved 13 properties. You know, one of the things I've always admired about you, Pete, is that you're able to just kind of lay out the issues in a very clear way. You always seem to have kind of a positive spin on where we should go, not in a false way. Right. And I've always noticed you're such a good listener when you're out at these town hall meetings and people come. Where did you kind of develop those abilities? Have you always kind of had those abilities from the start? Or is that something you've developed as time went on? I think we all learn from our experiences, but I also think all of us have different skill sets, and maybe I just stumbled into this, but you cannot engage in public life, public service, and representative government if you don't know what you're representing. It is important to listen. And I will give you two examples. Uh, there were meetings, and they were fierce meetings. People were furious, inflamed with me, over the dredging of the Indiana Harbor Ship Canal. There was no way I was ever going to change their mind. But one of the things that came out of all those meetings, because I listened, I did listen. Well, as you dredge and you put these spoils in a confined disposal area, they're going to dry out and it's going to pollute the air and poison us. I said, you know what? You may be right. So what we're going to do is right now, so we have a baseline for years before because the air, unfortunately, isn't perfect in Ishka, we're going to put air monitoring systems. It was a good idea. And the other thing I told people, okay, I have to listen for the people I never hear from, because I represent 730,000 people, most of whom never communicate to me. I hear from many, many thousands of my constituents who are on Medicare. I couldn't tell you the last time somebody on Medicaid came into my office and gave me a piece of their mind because they're just trying to get through today. Well, I truly appreciate everything that you've done for this, for this region and the vision you've had. Uh, if there was one more thing that you feel like, I just really got to get this done, and we're down to just probably a few seconds, I'm, I'm still, I want to get this done. Finish the train and let us open up that lakeshore for that quality of place. Let us open up that lakeshore so everyone can enjoy that immense natural resource so we keep and attract good quality people to Northwest Indiana. Well, you got the right, the right ideas and, and that's vision. I'm, I'm glad you made that mistake in Washington because it's kind of led us into a, a, a good I place. Learned. <laughs> yeah. So, that, well, that's, we all need to do that and I hope that we can learn a little bit more in the end. Thanks for coming on the show Thank and you sharing very much. your thoughts. We really appreciate it. Thank you. pay attention to polling, and how can you not, you will repeatedly see a finding that says the majority of Americans don't like how Washington, D.C. operates. The polls tell us that 7 out of 10, more than two-thirds, or 74 percent, and I've seen all these numbers, of citizens think the U.S. Congress cannot accomplish anything, the feds don't know what they are doing, or our current political system is dysfunctional. I find this fascinating because other polls will tell you that the same group of people feel their elected official to Washington is doing a great job. If you combine this perception with comments about how their friends and relatives are working in D.C. in an important job while doing great things, you have to be really confused. Let's be more specific and look at what works and what doesn't. I think there are three major complaints that have some legitimacy. The first is a criticism of the giant bureaucracy that is our federal government. It's huge, cumbersome, inefficient, and complex. It reaches its authority, it overreaches its authority, and involves itself in areas where it should not be. Congress operates within a political system which pressures our representatives to follow the party line, vote as a block, not compromise, or else... The else means not much support in the upcoming election, refusal to back the position of one who strays, or actions which criticize and damage credibility. On the other side of this equation is what works. 
I believe that we have some highly skilled, incredibly intelligent people working in government. They are trying to do their jobs under some challenging circumstances. And we have elected leaders who are attempting to balance the needs and wants of their constituencies back home and the nation as a whole. They work within a culture in America which makes demands and has unreasonable expectations at times. I think many of them have good intentions. I wish I had a solution on how to fix such a gigantic problem. I do know this. People work better when they are encouraged and appreciated. When we witness these people working hard, doing the right thing, listening and understanding, helping those in need, and truly making a difference, we need to recognize, acknowledge, applaud, and thank them. It's a bit of a joke when we say, if I was there, I could fix all this. Well, if these people eventually give up, we may have to go there and do just that. As always, I want to hear from you. We welcome your comments and thoughts about the content of this program or what is happening in our communities. You can email us at focus at lakeshorepublicmedia.org or reach us on our website, both listed on your screen. If you miss a show, watch it from our website or on YouTube by keying in Lakeshore Focus and you'll see my face pop up. Catch up on what you missed. Join us again next week for another Lakeshore Focus. Until then, I'm Keith Kirkpatrick saying make a positive difference in our world today.